But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lowest parts of the earth? He who descended himself, he who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Father, guide us in our time of consideration of your word this morning. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, our teacher. May he guide us so that we might learn what you'd have for us today. And we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Um, we come to the need for diversity in Christ's body. And an uh, interesting part of this, I remind you the church is God's church. And how he guides his church is through three things. His God-inspired word, his God-gifted people, and his God-ordained circumstances. Week after week, we focus on this, the word. We also, though, remind ourselves of the fact that he ordains all the circumstances in our life, and he thereby guides us by that. But one of the aspects that we need to be very aware of is his God-gifted people. And few churches uh, follow this as they should. With regard to that, just again to remind you of the basic principle that we are at stake here as we look at this passage. Um, I remind you, and I can keep coming back to this because it's huge. I, I personally spend much time in prayer considering these three things. And these are the three things I look at continually. God's inspired word, God's gifted people, and God's ordained circumstances. For myself personally, what is God guiding me to do in light of his word, in light of the circumstances, in light of the gifts that he's given to me? How does all of that come to play in my life? And in light of this, you see, that's how I seek God's will. It's the only way to ascertain it by these three things. Otherwise, we end up with all of our own ideas. We start out with the fact that we're liberated to serve. And I just remind you where it says, stop quenching the spirit in 1 Thessalonians 5. It is in that passage telling us to stop hindering others from using their God-given gifts. But I would suggest to you we need to stop allowing others to hinder us from using our God-given gifts. Uh, if God has gifted us, we need to function that giftedness and not let others stifle us in the use of that giftedness. That is where this came from. Just reminding you again, these three things God guides us by. So God's gifted people, and it's God who gifts them, are released, not by man but by God, in the context of God-ordained circumstances, the only thing that should stifle the use of gifts is if they violate the Word of God in their use. And so therefore, that's where elders come in. And it's just reminders that in this regard, elders don't belong here. That's God's place. Elders belong here, merely making sure that people don't violate the Word of God. The second thing we looked at was that we're empowered to serve. And again, it's a reminder that uh, God receives all the power and glory, not any to ourselves. And we must therefore humbly serve each other so that he might receive all the glory and power. Come to this part where we're unified to serve. And we set the background last week, but this is, by the way, I, I will say this. I think if you get a grasp of what we're saying today, it, we can transform your life in a, in a phenomenal way. 
what we've, we sense the importance of Christ-centered unity. That's in chapter 4, 1 to 16. We want to look today at the importance of Christ-produced diversity. And then the importance of Christ-like love. And, and I could do this in several sections, but I'm going to tie it all together in one message today. So here we go. In regard to this, again, there is a God-demanded unity in this passage, no doubt. And let me put it in a broader context again for you and reminding you that in Scripture, the path is pretty clear to follow. And as you look at this passage, this is not our path, it's the Apostle's path. He starts with a walking worthy and he has walking unity, non-worldliness, love, again light, and then finally in care. He picks up on that last one and has three negative positive things to say. But he picks up on the last of these, not drunk with wine, but filled with spirit, and he has three, five participles. He deals with these participles, and then he takes the last one of these, and once again builds on that in the latter part of the book as he brings it down to the home. The point that should be very, very clear is that one looks at this passage of Ephesians 4.1, and I just let these do it again. The, the, the fascinating truth of all of this is that when it comes to bear, Paul says, I want to apply this. And where he applies it, he brings it right down to the home, the husband, the wife. That is the most crucial thing. And today what we're going to look at ties in with that because out of that comes the father, child, and the master, slave. But the primary thing is there. And all of these issues pour right into here as we've seen. Unity does, non-worldliness does, and uh, all of these pour into this. By the way, my wife would like me to see, run those words up the other way so you could read them properly, but if I did, you'd be looking up instead of down to where you're supposed to look. So that's why it stays this way. But anyhow, here we go. The point of it all being, unity is what we see here. Pours right down to the husband and wife. Now, I want you to keep that in mind in light of this passage we look at. Now, God demanded unity, no doubt, and it's in this passage, and it's very clearly here. But when we come to this section, verses 7 to 16, the focus is definitely centered on Christ. We're going to see that. It focuses on Christ in relationship to his church, his body, and then focus on diversity. Those three things, but look with me at it, if you will. We're going to come, to first of all, to Christ. You can't miss this and you look at this passage. When you come to verses 7 to 16, which is the section we're looking at, it is, it is all about Christ and his church, big time. Now, when we, came, when we looked at chapter 5, we saw in 521 to 33 with the husband and wife, the primary issue is not husband and wife, it's Christ and the church. The, when you look at this, you understand that is the theological base from which everything works. You look at that, 521, look at this. Christ and his church, one, two, three, four, five, six times. If we could understand the relationship of Christ to his church, we would understand the relationship of the husband to wife. And if we don't, we won't. It's just simple. When that is all rooted in the passage where we are today, in, in an incredible way. So as we come to this passage, it isn't, new, it isn't a new thing in looking at Christ and his church because it is the issue in chapter 5 to 1 to 33, but it's the issue in chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Look at this, if you will. In this passage, Christ and his church, look at this. He, he just, throughout this passage, see, it's time and time and time again. It's, it's all about Christ and his relationship to the church, which in this context is called his body. And it just comes over and over and over and over again. You can't, you can't miss the fact that Christ is the focus. Why, why that is significant in this passage is because it's a stark contrast to 1 Corinthians 12. Now, I'm going to show you 1 Corinthians 12. Just, just look up here with me and watch this. In 1 Corinthians, well... Go back with me. Why not? Go back with me. Just it's only four books back. 1 Corinthians 12. It's fascinating because he starts out with the three persons of the Trinity, just like he does in Ephesians 4. In fact, the matter is in the same order. Look at this. Verse 4, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Holy Spirit is there. Then verse 5, there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse, the next verse, varieties of effects, but the same God 
God the Father who works all things in all persons. Now, it's fascinating because he's introduced the three persons of the Trinity, but now look what he does. In the verses that follow, the focus is totally on the Holy Spirit and God the Father. Look at, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To each one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Notice this, but now God has placed all the members. Notice, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. It isn't contradictory. It's just fascinating that in 1 Corinthians 12, he does the three persons of Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then he, in a sense, focuses just primarily on the Father and the Holy Spirit. But now look at this passage. He's done the three persons of the Trinity again. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one God and Father of all. Here are the three persons of the Trinity. But as soon as he finishes that, he leaves and focuses purely on the Lord Jesus Christ. No mention to God the Father, no mention to God the Holy Spirit. It's fascinating because the tendency, I was looking and just reading something this morning on this passage. It's fascinating because the, the person talks about spirit-given gifts. The point of it is, in this passage, nothing about spirit-given gifts. It's Christ-given gifts. The focus is certainly on, look at this, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Why is he in a position to do this? Because he is the one who descended and then ascended. He is the one who is exalted Lord. He is the one who gave some as apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers. It's all about Christ. It's a Christ-focused emphasis here in this passage. Now, with regard to that, as you look at this, then it's Christ and his church. It's pure and simply that. Why is he in a position to do so? Notice this. Go back with me. I'm back in Ephesians again. Why is he in a position to do Go back with me to chapter 1. Notice, he's talking about the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. I'm starting in chapter 1, verse 20, which he brought about, the power which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body. Fascinating, because in this context, he just sticks with the body which is the church, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So why is Christ in a position to give the gifts? Because of his exalted position at the right hand of God. God's put everything in subjection under his feet. And he, he therefore, because of that exalted position, he is giving gifts to his people. Now, Christ is central. This not here. We've, we've talked about this. Someone has made the statement very interesting. I just make the observation. He doesn't move from Christology in chapter 1 to 3 to the church in chapter 4 to 6. He still leaves Christology in chapter 4 to 6. He is the central focus of everything that happens in his church. He just is. And the passage so clearly tells us that. The focus is and must always be on the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, because if you look at 4.4, there is only one body. And it's fascinating in this passage, that body is the, the church, of the, the body of Christ. It's his body. The church is his body. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's his. It's also presented as exalted. We are to grow up and unto him who is the head. See, the whole purpose, he started the church and he's the ultimate end of it. Everything leads, comes from him and everything ends up with him. He is clearly presented as a giver of gifts. Now, one observation I need to make just an aside. It says here, look at, look at how he builds this argument in verse 7. To each one grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts, which is the earth, gender of opposition. The earth is the lower parts, and now he is exalted to heaven, far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. 
All of this discussion about him to build up why he can give gifts is because of who he is and his exalted position. Now, I have this quotation. I'm not going to go into it, but it's interesting because it says he gave gifts to men. If you look at Psalm 69, he received gifts. But I will read this. Regardless of the interpretation one prefers, it must be acknowledged that Psalm has been changed by Paul to make it applicable to the present Ephesian context. He declares that the gifts to which he refers are of a spiritual nature and are given to believers in the Ephesian assembly and by application believers down through the ages. The point Paul is trying to make is the fact that Christ who ascended as victor has a right to give gifts. For if Christ had been defeated, he would yet be in his grave and spiritual gifts would be useless to those whom he sought to re or could not redeem. Consequently, those who are held in their bondage, Satan, sin, and death have been freed and have obtained the gifts. But the whole point of all of this, he just wants to say to us, because of where Christ is, the exalted Christ, he is able to give gifts to all of us. Now, he is the one and only Lord of his church. There's only one body, there's only one Lord, 4, 4, and 5. He is the exalted Christ. God raised him and exalted him, gave him authority over everything, everything, everything in the church. And he's not sharing that with anybody. Put everything in subjection under his feet. Move on. He is, he is the source of the life of this church. He is. Notice, speaking the truth, love, we are to grow up in all aspects of him, who is the head from whom the whole body. Let me go back to that, 415. If you will, I'll read that for you. Easier I put it there. From whom the whole body. Okay. Being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies. But see, the whole point of it, the body comes from him, and the whole purpose of the body is to exalt him and to become like him. That's why we're here. The only reason why we're here. Okay, now, let me to do this. The second thing that's emphatic in this passage is diversity. Now, watch this. I want you to show why we do this. Because, the, the, first of all, there's no doubt that unity is a big issue in this passage. Verses 3 and 13. We looked at that together last week. But look at something. The larger section, verses 7 through 16, <coughs> talks about diversity within God's church. It's fascinating because there is unity in diversity. And may I say to you, there's universe, unity because of diversity. Um, if you and your wife weren't so different, if you and the other members of this body weren't so different, we wouldn't have a good functioning body. That's a fact. It's just how life is. And so when you look at this, the larger section has to do with the fact that there's diversity in God's church. There's diversity in your home. There just is. You're different. Praise God you're different. Don't try to make anybody like you. That messes up God's whole plan. Doesn't get you anywhere. It just, it just puts everybody in a state of tension. It's, it, watch this with me, okay? Look at this. The largest section of here is this. There is no doubt in this section that from the very beginning to the end is diversity in the church. It's, we're all different. When you look at this, so there's a God-demanded unity, it is true, but see, the biggest part of this is diversity. We're different. We're flat-out different. Not any one of us like anybody else, and that's on purpose. Now watch this. So here we are. But notice something. Notice this is given to us by Christ. The whole section of this thing is this way. He has said on high, he led captive hosts of captives. He gives gifts to men. He ascended. He, see, it's all about Christ and what he did. He is the one who made us different. We're not different just because we're different. We're not different just because of our background. We're not different just because of our circumstances. We're different because he made us different. It's flat out how it is. And we weren't meant to be the same. He gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists for the building up until we all attained the unity of the faith, the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. See, he made us different for a reason. Now watch this with me. No doubt diversity exists. It's just no doubt. We're all different on purpose. No doubt that that's Christ, Christ produced. 
He is the one who gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers. He did this. Nobody else did it. He did it. It's interesting because you look at the whole buildup here. We saw that in verses 8 and 9. Why in the world build this up about how he came to earth and how he ascended to heaven and how he's seated in a place of victory and how because of that he's able to give gifts? Why all of that is to show us that he is the source of all the differences in our lives and in the body. It's fascinating. It is all significant because it moves from the Trinity in verses 4 through 6 to this whole focus on Christ and the diversity of his church. Look at this. Christ and diversity. Watch this. As you look at this passage, see, look at this. Each was given, grace was given, look at this, by that which every joint supplies, look at this. The fact is the proper working of each individual part. What ties this whole passage, they call it an inclusio, or which is another word, an envelope. What ties this whole thing together and holds it together is the fact we're radically different than each other. That's what ties it together, and we're different for a reason. That is the overriding statement of this passage. It's fascinating because so, for so many of us, we focus so much of our time on apostles, pastor, pastor, teacher business, and that is only one verse in the midst of this whole section, and the section isn't focusing on them, it's focusing on all of us. Now watch this with me. It's interesting because it's command to unity, chapter 4, in verses 1 and 2. Then the foundation of unity is a trinity, but now he says, how does this work out? How does this thing work out? And in the whole, he says, it works out in the diversity that exists within the church. And may I remind you again, if you learn about Christ in church, you'll learn about the marriage, and it starts right here. We were made different. I'm just telling you, it's, it's, it's so cru crucial here. The diversity and variety is the issue of verses 7 to 16, the largest section here. Now, let me suggest to you something, that this diversity and this difference did not start when we were saved. It started before we were ever born. Love this from the psalmist. Look at this. For thou didst form my inward parts. Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very, very well. Look at this part. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Before there was a single day in my life, God had ordained the days and they were in his book before I was ever born. I mean, just put that in perspective for yourself. Just stop for a while and realize how monumental phenomenal that is. God designed who you are and he designed it before you were ever saved. He designed it before you were ever born. You are who you are by God's grace and God's design. But watch this. Take it further. Look at this next part here. Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nation. He did this all before I was born. All before you were born. Look at this. And when he, Galatians, has set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, that I might preach among the Gentiles, did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor to go up to Jerusalem to those who are apostles before me. Look at this. I understand. He started this process not on the road to Damascus. He started it before I was ever born. The road to Damascus was just a part of the journey, but the journey started way back when. I was talking to a dear lady and uh, talked to her about Psalm 119. She says, well, it's so long, I just skip it. I says, no, 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 no. <laughs> so I make it a practice when I read in the morning to start with Psalm 119. I just take one section. That's all I do, one section by itself. It is so transforming. It is. And there are some that I really look forward to. This is one of them. Look at this. Your hands made me and fashioned me. 
Okay? That's good. So he made me and fashioned me. Okay, well, watch this. So now I'm asking you, give me understanding that I might learn your commandments. I just want to understand how to cope with that which you've made me to be. And I want to do it in light of your word. I come to this every time I come. I love this passage. I am who I am because you fashioned me to be this way. All I want to know is understand how to deal with it, how to cope with it, how to respond to it in light of your word. That's what I want to know. And I'm frustrated unless you help me figure it out. Amazing. You are who you are because God designed you way before you were ever born. He knew who you were going to be. And so when you look at this and say, boy, I, I've heard somebody. I wish I was like somebody else. Don't ever wish that. We'd all be the losers if that's what you were. Talked to someone at length on the phone yesterday just to tell them, release yourself. It's not let somebody else release you. Release yourself from what you expect yourself to be. Somehow, let go. It is amazing as you look at this because we're back to this again, see? And the whole point of it, he did it. He did it. He designed all of this. And he did it because of his ascended position, exalted position in heaven. He made me who I am. And he did it before I was ever born. And therefore, I need to, I need to revel in the fact that God made me who I am. Now, here we are again, just to remind you of this, okay? In the midst of the emphasis on unity comes diversity, it just does. Now, I remind you again, and we're going to come to this. Diversity has to exist because there cannot be unity without the diversity, it can't be. We'll come back to this. There is no doubt diversity is absolutely necessary. Look at this. Look at the passage, look what it says. I'm driving verse 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love, and by the way, the... Um, some don't think it's speaking. They think it's truthing in love. It could be. In other words, living a life of, of uh, honesty and integrity in love. In a context that seems to be a speaking part of it because you're responding to the doctrine and so forth, but I, I still, the, the truth is still there. But notice this. In the context, go back. Speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You know what? Every part is needed. This isn't the only passage that talks about this. Look at this 1 Corinthians 12. For the body is not one member, but many. It isn't. That's just it's a good, great thing. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? And never forget Dr. Feinberg. He says, God made us with two ears and one mouth, but we act as if he did it the other way around. Uh, because we talk so much and listen so little. But, but you know what? It is an amazing part that God blended the body the way he did. God has placed the members, each one of the body, just as he desired, spiritually and physically, if you will. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? If everybody was the face or the nose or the eyes, where in the world would the rest of the body be? It wouldn't be. Now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. I was so impressed with what I, did. I added on to the house, quite extensive part, many years ago. Um, I did the plumbing, all running the plumbing out by myself. I poured the concrete, framed it. Um, had people come in and help at times, but basically it was the work I did. And I was so impressed because there was a slant going down from the front door to the front of where the addition was. And I thought, you know, it's nice, I'll do this little stages, okay. So it went out a bit and put a row of bricks in there to, to set it off. And one of the elderly gentlemen, 80-year-old man, came by the house one day. He says, Don, this isn't good. He said, for people like us, when you put those bricks like that, we can't see that there's a step there. And see, when the eyes don't tell the foot where the foot's supposed to go, you're going to be flat on your nose, okay? It's just as simple as that. And you thought it was such a nice design, but for senior citizens, it wasn't a nice design. See, because it all, by the way, it's fascinating, isn't it? 
When you talk about love and hate, either one of those, fascinating. Or let us take fear, fear and love. Fear? You can see something, your eye sees it. You don't feel anything, you just see it. All of a sudden you become lividly fearful. You do. Your knees begin to tremble. You start to sweat. You start to do things that you have no control over because the eye saw something and it's warning the body. And the same with love, the eye sees something and you just it's just how it is, okay? So you look at this business, see how the body was made, the way the body was made. And if it doesn't function together, you have major, major problems. Major, major problems. So, God made the body this way, and he says that diversity is absolutely essential, and you cannot have a tr properly functioning body unless it all functions this way. The point is on every joint supplies, work, the proper work of each individual part, all in verse 16. Notice the proper growth happens only when each part does its work. So, your body is individually necessary. Every part of your body is individually necessary for each other part. Corporately dependent on each other. I definitely need each one of you. And you definitely need me. It's just true. The body can't be what the body should be unless each of us is involved. It just can't be. As God meant it to be. Now, take me a step further than this. It's interesting because every I, I use connecting point. I'll tell you why I use connecting points because of here. Some people have translated this ligaments and so forth like that, but see the trouble is they can't come to a conclusion what this talking about. Well, the word is the word joint is hafes. It is it is from the verb hop to the touch. And it just it's just Hang in there with me for a bit. It can bear the idea of fastening to or tying to. Okay? Listen to me. Every part of the body, every part of the body is somehow touching another part of the body. It is. Let's, let's not get tied away with a ligament or what in the world it is. It's not that. It's, uh, just, just take the turn. Every connecting point, every, every part of the body touches another part of the body. It just, there's no way it functions unless it does. So now, when you do it like that, it should be clear, we point out this passage in real life. Each of these parts is connected to the head, which this passage tells us. So, rather than translate ligaments, I translate connecting points. No, they just hang in there with me. You see, you touch. You can't help it. God designed you to touch other people. You, you can't live without touching other people. And God designed you to touch them in a particular way that nobody else can touch them. I have this, okay. I, it's the can think, but, but look at this. This is a cardiovascular system. But you know what? I, I want to show you something because, you know, there are veins and arteries here that they want to show you in the cardiovascular system. But what they don't show you is this. It's a capillary. It comes from the Latin word capillaris. It's a minute, it, it, the word means hair, that's the original word. Because they're hair-like. They're minute, thin, walled vessels. I'm taking that as a dictionary. One of the smallest vessels of the blood vascular system. Notice if you're forming networks throughout the body. I just, just think about this for a bit. I come back to that. Well, I'll stop here for a bit. You know, you're aching somewhere. Okay, we can talk about the, you know, um, arteries and where you have problems with the arteries and they become clogged and therefore you can die because of that or veins but you know what pop an Advil someday or a Tylenol or just a simple aspirin well you pop it because there's a pain somewhere I used to I used to go golfing with guys whoever I was with and there was a couple of them one was an engineer the other was a dentist and it's funny be standing the first tee, and the guy says, have you had your Advil yet this morning? They, they, they pop a pill before they even start just to make sure they had no pains, okay? What you're doing is what? Forcing the blood to rush to that part of the body to somehow bring release from the problem, are you not? 
Do you know what gets it finally down to where you want it to be? It's these small little capillaries. You may not be a vein and you may not be an artery, my friend. You may be a simple capillary, but you take the capillaries out of play and you know what? There's going to be pain in the body that you can't solve. Simple. Just don't just hang in there with me. I'm going to I'm going to keep on here. This is the muscular system. But but my, I do this for a reason. Watch this. Look at how beautifully the body is made by God. Didn't evolve. It came to watch this all. Every connecting part must properly work. It says that. Notice from whom the whole body, in verse 16, being fitted and held together by which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. If one part doesn't work, it doesn't happen, okay? Notice, according to the working process and measure, each individual part. That's all right, I'll keep looking forward, it'll be better. So notice that as each part duly fulfills its proper function, that's what it is. The body is true, the church is true. Look at this verse, verse 16, uh, verse 15, 16. I put it back up for this reason. Speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects unto him, who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted together and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper work of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the, for growth of the body for the building of itself in love. Now watch this. Every connecting point, it says in this verse, are you with me? Now watch this. Every connecting point points to provide something unique. Secondly, every connecting point must be properly working to provide what it's supposed to provide. Every connecting point, when it fulfills its duty, number one, the body of Christ is properly fit together. Secondly, the body of Christ is properly held together. Thirdly, the body of Christ is properly growing. It can't grow unless all of these things work together. By the way, it's interesting. I went, um, we went to Santa Barbara recently on a trip down in June. And it's where we used to go. And uh, almost every time we were to Santa Barbara, I'd run a minimum of 10 miles by the beach in the, every morning. That's just what I do. And then we went to San Diego, and I'd do the same thing down there. When I was preparing for marathons, I'd love to go to San Diego, and I like running by water. Well, I am not running as much as I used to, and I decided to go out running by the beach in Santa Barbara and then by the water in San Diego. There were parts of the body that weren't functioning like they used to function, and it's a whole bunch of parts of the body. The breathing wasn't what it used to be. The, the muscles weren't what they used to be. You see, everything has to blend together to make it happen. It doesn't matter. I'll just take one part out of the equation. When you have a whole bunch of parts that aren't working, it doesn't work like it used to work. Just to tell you, it only grows this way because of this. Now watch with me. The emphasis, see, is every joint providing, properly working for every part, you shut down one part of the body, my friend, the whole body is, fun, is, is affected by it, so it fits together, held together. Um, here we are again. See, the body is fitted together by that which each individual provides. The body is held together by that which each individual provides. The body continues to grow by that which each individual part of the body provides. Um, Let me, I, I, the illustration. He's one of my favorite sports figures today. He plays for the Los Angeles Clippers. His name is Blake Griffin. You can see how he, I mean, he just goes over guys unbelievably. So last year they had this dunking contest. Well, this is what he did. This is the stages. He, he won by jumping over the front of a car and a, and a fellow teammate threw the ball up to him. You see between the third and fourth one. Threw the ball up, he caught it, and he dunked it. So here he is coming in like this. He caught the ball, and there he's dunking it. All right? Now, now here, I'll tell you why I'm, I'm doing this. I'm going to do it just show you Blake Griffin, although I could. He was chosen to be on the Olympic team this year. Great honor. Look at just a few people. Was it 12 of them, is it? Whatever it is. But you know what? He was in. 
but he's now out. Great honor of his life to be chosen among all the hundreds and hundreds of athletes like that to be in the Olympics, but he can't play. Why? Because, I quote this, medial meniscus tear in his left knee. Isn't that fascinating? You can be the greatest sport figure there is, but you know what? Just take one part of your anatomy, stops the function, and you know what? The rest of it is shut down. It's just simple. Just simple. Take you another thing, just, just start a sports pages. The Angels signed a guy there paying $21 million a year. They're losing big money on him, but he's been out for two months. Why? Torn ligament, right thumb. You $21 million, and you know what? It's all this torn ligament, right month, and you're sitting on your, you know, duff doing nothing, okay? This is a figure skater, torn labrum, left hip. She can't compete right now. Pitcher, right tendon inflammation. Just, just, just hang in there. Michelle to Panada, anterior labral tear. Uh, Ricky Rubio, two torn ligaments, left knee. Uh, former light heavyweight championship. He's got torn ligaments in both the elbows. You, you know the whole point of all this? Rotator cuff for this guy. Labor. I don't even care what those things are. <laughs> don't listen to me. I, I don't know what you are. You may be a capillary. You may be a labrum, I don't know. You may be, what, what, is, what, what is his problem back here again? Um, what is what Blake Griffin's problem? You, you, you may be what, a meniscus, whatever in the world it is, okay? I think it has to do with cartilage, but I think that's what it is, but it's immaterial. Don't know what you are, have no clue, but you, let me tell you something. You're a uniquely different individual, and Christ made you to be that way. And the fact of the matter is, he did it so that you might be able to provide something that nobody else in this world can provide. Nobody but you. That, that's how crucial. And to, and somehow, when you start to minimize your role in life, understand how important you are. And number one, humbly, Christ can do without you. He can but he's made it in such a way that he wants to have you a part of it and he can't fulfill what he wanted to fulfill unless you fulfill what he made you to fulfill. That's simple. It's just, it's a clear point of this passage. Without your significant, unique contribution to your marriage, to your family, and to the church, the world into which Christ placed you will never be what it ought to be. That's a fact. And um, talk with so many people who, they, they do it themselves. They enslave themselves by trying to become something they were never meant of God to be. And not being satisfied with what God meant them to be and not living up to that. And, and the interesting part in a home, you don't want a wife trying to remake a husband or a husband trying to remake a wife. It's a lost cause number one. It's attention causing cause number two. Remember a dear lady saying to me, I wish my husband would do like so-and-so else's husband. I said, come off of it. He's a great man. Just accept him for what he is. But that's the same woman who says, I wish I would like somebody else. And I said, you don't want to be like somebody else. You're an amazing woman like you are. It's, it's fascinating, the, the whole point of this. Let me take you, I must move on. I, I, let me tell you, nobody else can determine this but you. As I did this pastor, I reflected. Way back when, first church I pastored, I was all of, at that time I was 22. And um, this, I'm preaching on Sunday morning, or I'm getting ready. And this lady walks in with four children to sit down in the pew. Um, first time ever in church, never seen them before. That night, the husband came and sat. By the way, those kids never, it's not good or bad, they just, I just reflect on they, they never, they sat with their parents every Sunday morning as long as we were in that body. They brought a great blessing to us because they'd invite us over to their house Sunday night. We'd go to the house Sunday night, she'd make sandwiches, and then we'd sit around the piano and we'd just sing. So for two years in that church, I directed the choir, and he sat in the choir. Oh, he's a better musician than I by a long ways. Don't even begin to compare. But 
Well, I'd have the alto sing, he'd sing with the altos. I'd have the bass sing, he'd sing with the bass. I'd tenor sing, he'd sing with it. He, he made me look good by doing what he did. And then his wife is a great soprano, so life was good. After a couple of years, you know, he decided, you know what, I, I'd take over the choir. I thought it was about time, but uh, yeah, he did. He went to another church after I left that church, and he was dealing with the choir there. And then one day, he, he, he got the opportunity to teach a Bible class in the church, and pretty soon he began to realize this is more important than the choir. As much as I love music, is what I need to do. He had to find that for himself. And I watch him move from not doing the choir, doing the choir, then walking away from the choir to do this, which to him was a higher calling. And it was fun to watch because he had to find it. Steve and I attended a memorial service a few months back, and uh, the fellow was involved there. I poured my life in him for so long, but one, he was in Sunday school class I was teaching, and I was going to be gone for a few weeks, and I said, will you teach for me? And I got back, and I said, where do I take over? He says, I'm not done yet. I said to myself, it's time to move on to another Sunday school class and let him have this one. You see, somehow you find it yourself. I will say it if you don't mind in this context, but I remember he was going to go in the military. They asked him to go take some classes, and he got his grades back one day. He says, I can do this. I'd love to have told him. I could have told you that a long time ago, but he had to figure it out for himself and ended up going to school instead of going to the military and going to the ministry. See, you, you, nobody can do this for you. They can't. This, this is beyond what you have a proclivity to do or what you, you know, this has to do with what God has designed you to do. And when you begin to understand that only you can find this, only you can find it. I must take you on quickly. So the diversity, but it's in the context of unity, I remind you that it just is. It has to do that. Now, let me take you one more. Here we go this. So definitely diversity. But now, the, the, th the third thing that shows up in this passage, Christ is a focus, no doubt. The diversity is a focus, no doubt. But there's another thing, and that's this word building up. Look at this. God gave, the, Christ gave the gifts for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, for the building up of the body of Christ. That's why he gave the gifts. This, this by the way, is, is the original bodybuilding. This is the original bodybuilding. He designed all of us so that we would build up. The, that's why he gave you the gifts. You can't have this body built unless everybody does it. From whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body. What? For the building up of itself in love. This is real bodybuilding. Pure bodybuilding. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints. In God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple, Lord, in whom you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. How about 1 Corinthians? Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, him will God destroy, for the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. You know what? Don't, don't go messing with God's body, Christ's body, with God's church. He designed it the way he designed it to be built the way he did. By the way, a frustration for me, church is going to hire a pastor. Number one, there, that's a problem in itself, but they're going to hire a pastor. So they go out into a survey of the people. What kind of pastor do you think we need? And then they come up with this thing. They start looking for this guy. Then he comes in there. And I've shared with you. There was a, I was talking with a layman one day, and he had been a, on the board of a church. And one of my former students was this pastor, and he says, greatest preacher I ever sat under. And I said, why in the world did you join the other elders in running him out of the church? You know why? Because the former pastor, whose brother is a senator today back in Washington, former pastor was a great preacher but also a great administrator, and this guy could administrate the same way that guy could, so they bumped him out. Build around his giftedness. Don't try to redesign him. Greatest preacher I ever sat under. Yeah, amazing. Watch this, okay? The emphasis on building up 
By the way, here, here's the interesting part. You only build up the bodies you build up on another. It's just true. Look at this. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such as is good for edification, building up. Listen, when you talk to people, only building up words, not tearing down words. Only building up words. You know what? You can correct somebody with a building up word. You don't have to tear them down. It's amazing how we find ourselves tearing down. The goal of all of this is to grow up into Christ. It is. Notice this. Speaking the truth, we grew up in all aspects into him. That's the whole point. He started it. He's the end of it. We're supposed to have a common faith. We all attain to the unity of the faith, and that should come over with the Son of God. Faith in the Son of God. Knowledge of the Son of God. And while we finally come to what? Notice the thing. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. In other words, my friend, we want to become like him. That's what we want to become. It's all about him. He made us this way so that we collectively could become like him. Aspire to the full measure of the perfection found in Christ. Now, I want to take you one step further, okay? The goal of all of this is a unified body. Not, not, not a whole bunch of mature men. He says a mature man. We focus so much. In our, oh, let me take you further here. The sign of this. As you look at this, we're no longer to be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You know, but speaking the truth in love, you know what? We need to move from independence to interdependence. We in America are the most independent people. We don't need anybody else. Yes, you do. One of the great passages is this. I didn't realize it for years. Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. You know what? We're supposed to bear one another's burdens. I got this thrown to my face so strongly one day when a student of mine, I, and we started class, we'd spend any, sometimes up to a half hour in prayer for each other. I mean, you say, well, it's about Greek, but it's also about each other. And one time we're ready to pray and a student puts up his hand, I know who he is, I know what his name is. <laughs> that much of an impact on my life. I was just young and teaching on this side of the ocean. And he says to me, we appreciate the fact you pray for us. Have you nothing for which we can pray for you? Boy, we prayed so fast that day. I had grown up where I had a lot of hurts in my younger years. And I wasn't going to let anybody hurt me again. And I wasn't going to open up. It just wasn't going to happen. Boy, I've come a long way since then. See, I, I, I know that people need me, but I didn't realize how much I needed them. And, um, yeah, you see, when you, this is why this, this thing, bear one of those burdens, and then notice, if you think you're something, you're nothing, you deceive yourself. If you are here today and you think, you know what, I don't need anybody else, the only person you're deceiving is you. We all know better. We know that you need others. But you somehow in your pride aren't going to go there, and you don't want to do that. It took me so long to get there. And in my, I just, when I started ministry, I'd been hurt enough in my years, and I wasn't going to let anybody hurt me again. But you know, I realized something. You could come and say something nasty, and it wouldn't hurt me, but you could say something good, and it wouldn't help me either. Because I had so hardened my heart from being hurt. I didn't want anybody to get inside. I got to tell you today, I can be hurt awful badly. I'm not going to let it destroy my relationship with somebody, but I, I, I let myself be hurt. I decided enough of this business of trying to harden myself from feelings and, and the response to them. And so just to say to you, we, we need to move from our independence to interdependence. We just do. The whole thing is the whole body is filled and held, fit together and held together, but which every connecting point provides. We need to move from uh, self-centered immaturity to body-centered maturity. We are so self-centered. Oh, my goodness. Just, just look at your life. It's what it is. See, mature people realize it's about a mature man, not mature men. Mature people realize that as important as independent growth is, corporate growth is equally important if that's what keeps churches and marriages together. Boy, I've seen people that grow individually in a marriage, but they're not growing corporately in a marriage, and the marriage won't hold. It just won't hold, nor will the church. We realize that a couple's development is as important as individual development. So as you build yourself, make sure that you build the whole body. And by yourself, it doesn't go. A mature husband, 
husband or wife knows that the marriage is growth is important as individual growth it just is let me take it further we need to move from childish instability to mature stability I'm back to all of this no longer be children we're so childlike we are many of us we're way past childhood but we're still acting as childish as can be mature people realize that mature stability must take the place of childish instability it's, it's true of the church, it's true of the marriage. So, how does this happen? Each member of Christ's body, it's important. Everybody is important. Each minister in Christ's body, and he has ministers of church at large, that's what apostles, prophets, evangelists were. They, were. they were ministering to the church at large. And by the way, two of them don't even exist today. They do in heaven, but not here. And then local ministry. Now, let me take you further. Truth and honesty and love. But I, I need to end with this because love is a crucial issue. Let me show you this. Let me show you something here. See this? Speaking the truth in love. This is another envelope here, which is fascinating. One envelope is unity. Another envelope is diversity. Another envelope is love. He starts there in love. He ends in love. Let me show you in Greek so you see it. Look at this. See, and agape, and agape, see? Listen to me. Will you look at this just for a bit? Because... He's talking about our differences. We address each other as different people. We need to do it in love, we do. Um, it isn't enough just to say, well, I'll give you my opinion. Give it in a loving way. Now watch this. It must be a Christ-like love. It's interesting in this passage, anything less than a Christ-like love is totally unacceptable. Look at this. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. This is to everybody. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you. Listen, Christ-like love. Let me take you further. It's a Christ-like selfless and sacrificial love. He loved the church and gave himself up for her. You must be willing to sacrifice yourself for the sake of others. It's not your way or the highway. Notice this, be imitators of God and walk in love as Christ also loved and gave himself an offering as sacrifice. See, you can't function in your differences without understanding the fact Christ made you different for a purpose. But secondly, understand the only way you can function as different people together is as you have Christ-like love. That's what helps you to do it. Let me take you a step further. Forbearing love. Look at this. I start with... Chapter 4, verse 2. Notice this. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. Notice again, as you look at this in this context, um, it goes right from being diligent to do this, to maintain unity with this forbearing with one another. Now, what is this all about? Let me suggest to you. Showing forbearance to love, being diligent. We can only maintain unity and diversity by putting up with each other's differences. That's true. Notice something else. Showing forbearance. We can only deal with each other's differences as we are long-suffering. You know, the word is long-fused. Yeah, you don't let someone go ticking you off. It just doesn't work. You don't do that. We saw it in First Peter. You have a stretching love. It just stretches and stretches and stretches and stretches. And you don't let people push you out of shape. Notice this. With all humility and gentleness, we can only show such love as we exhibit humility and meekness. Not, and that's not a weakness, by the way. So here's the issue. We start with our marriage. We realize we're different. And Christ made us this way. It didn't just start last year. It started before we were ever born. He made us different on purpose. And he made us different so that we would blend together and provide something the other could not provide. And we do it because we're able to put up with the differences of others and respond to them. Look at this. That oh, unwholesome word proceeding mouth, only such as is good for the edification or building up of others. Um, no yelling. It doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get you anywhere. You can correct, but you can correct in a building up way, not a tearing down way. It is so easy to tear down. It's so tough to build up. But that's what we're here to do. Let all bitterness and wrath and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. Now it must be forgiving though. 
That's right. Look at this. Be kind one to another, tender heart, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. This is later on in the same chapter. It must be a forbearing love and it must be a forgiving love. You know, we've got to be forgiving big time. Look at this. Not so word, but only such as good for edification. It may give grace to us here. No bitterness, no anger, but rather forgiveness. No bitterness, no anger. Tender hearted forgiveness, even as God forgave us. Amazing, isn't it? The story that Jesus told a fellow who owned so much. It was in the millions and millions of dollars. And the master forgave him. He went out and he found somebody else who owed him such a, just a meager bar, like three months worth of work. And he put him in jail because of it. And God's whole point, I forgave you so much. Can't you forgive one another? So Peter says, how many times do we forgive? Seven times. Jesus, 70 times seven. Now don't go adding up to 490 and stop at 490, okay? That's not the point he's making. We must be forgiving people, so there we are. That's how it is. Unified to serve. May God help us in our differences to be united and realize the differences are what make the body what the body ought to be because he made us that way for his own reason and his own purpose. Father God, thank you for your goodness and grace to us. Thank you for this passage. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the practicality of it. And our Father, we want to understand about you and the church. Christ's relationship to the church, a relationship of love, a relationship of forgiveness, a relationship of forbearance, help us to learn from that. And our Father, we just again pray that this week might be a great, great week as we walk with you in the fullness of your spirit. Again, learning more of you, trusting in you, knowing you better, becoming like you, so that our lives might exhibit that which you seek to exhibit for your glory and your good. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen. And Lord bless.